All right, so integrating properties of nerve centers. In the words of the great master Yoda, learn it you will, teach it I shall. In this lesson, you will learn what is nervous integration and how do neurons respond when they receive several orders. What you should know from the previous lessons are the following ideas. What are inhibitory and excitatory synapses? And what is the threshold of depolarization? If these ideas don't ring a bell, please refer to my other previous videos to understand them better. Alright, so let's start by reading the introduction together. In a nerve center, they say, a neuron is connected to a multitude of other neurons. So we recognize connection between neurons as synapses, but what do they mean by a nerve center? A nerve center is a group of neurons, usually in the brain or the spinal cord, that receive sensory information and release orders to control certain reactions in the body. So in the Marrakesh Karar, the Elbil, al brain or the spinal cord, centers of decision. They receive messages and give out orders. Very good. Hence, it receives, meaning the nerve center, several afferent messages and elaborates. What, wait a second. What does afferent message mean? Afferent messages are the arriving messages or the input. So if we have two connected neurons here through a synapse, the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, the message brought in by the presynaptic neuron, the input, is actually the afferent message. Very well. But in the, cent in the text they said it receives several, several afferent messages. So this means that the same neuron is being connected to more than one presynaptic neuron as such and receiving more than one afferent message. Okay, now that's clear. Let's return to the text. So it receives several afferent messages and elaborates or produces only one efferent message. So let me give you a time to, to, to think about it. Try to guess what does efferent mean. Very good. So an efferent message is the leaving message, the output, like such. Okay, great. So it receives several inputs and gives one output. What are the different types of afferent messages? Wait, so there are types of afferent messages? Oh, oh, they must mean the following. They must mean the excitatory and the inhibitory messages. Remember, we studied before that um, the nervous messages or the input from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic one can be in this form or that form. In this form, the membrane potential starts at rest at minus 70, but after stimul stimulation, we have a small hypopolarization wave which approaches the threshold, meaning it's encouraging it to form a response or an action potential. So this is what we call an EPSP for excitatory postsynaptic potential, and it's usually observed in excitatory synapses. So this is an excitatory afferent message or an input. This, on the other hand, shows that after being at rest and after the stimulation, the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell has moved further away from the threshold. So it's being discouraged to form a response. So this is an IPSP or inhibitory postsynaptic potential observed in inhibitory synapses. This should not be news to you because I explained this before in the previous video. If you don't understand it, please re-watch the video again. All right. What next? So, these are the different types of messages. What is the role of the neuron in the processing of these messages? What are they asking us here? So, they're saying, in other words, what does this nerve center do when it receives several inputs, particularly when these inputs are not identical, meaning one excitatory, the other inhibitory? So, let's discover in the lesson together. And that, guys, is actually an example of a single synapse with several inputs, proving that repetitive nagging does work. 
Okay, so let's uh, translate that into neurons. Here we can see we have a single synapse between a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. And uh, we're reading at first the membrane potential on the postsynaptic cell. We're going to apply a single stimulation on the presynaptic neuron and see what happens. So there we go. We apply the stimulation here. Here it is on the graph. After some time, some delay time, we notice a change in the membrane potential. It's becoming less negative. This delay, first of all, is called the synaptic delay. It's the time taken for the synaptic process to occur. Now, if you look at the membrane potential here, we have a decrease in negativity. It's approaching the threshold. However, it doesn't reach the threshold of depolarization, meaning that no action potential is formed, and thus it returns back to rest and remains at minus 70. So what do we call this wave? We call it a, exactly an EPSP, a hypopolarization wave which qualifies as an excitatory postsynaptic potential. All right, so let's start by applying two successive stimulations on the same presynaptic neuron. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, stimulate it twice. This is the first one and the second one. What happened here? You notice that we got two hypopolarization waves um, being added together being superimposed over each other. And it's now closer to the threshold. However, it still doesn't reach the threshold, so it returns back to rest. So here we have summation of the afferent messages of the two EPSPs. Each one corresponds to a stimulation, but no action potential is produced because we didn't reach the threshold, so no efferent message is elaborated. Let's increase the number of stimulations. So now three successive stimulations. Just like the nagging. Give me snack, give me snacks, give me snacks. So now, one, two, three, what's happened now? Notice that we got a higher uh, total wave at the end. It's being added one after the other until we reach the threshold. And then we have the action potential wave. So the summation of the affinite messages and there is an action potential produced. An affinite message is elaborated. So, what would happen if the stimulations were separated by a longer duration now? Let's say we perform the first stimulation and wait some time, and then what happens? We give the other stimulation. Notice that here, we have no summation of the afferent messages because of the delay time we had between the two stimulations. It's something very similar to the, the computer mouse. The mouse, the mouse, the computer. When you want to double-click, the um, duration between the two clicks ought to be very small. Otherwise, it simply won't work. Okay? So, this type of summation or integration of the afferent messages, integration, by the way, means combining, of the afferent messages separated by small durations is called temporal summation. Yes, I've been through a lot, guys, just to try to prove a point. So the point of the video is that, yes, cooperative nagging also works. So what does that mean to the synapses? Here we have an example of a postsynaptic neuron here, the blue one, being connected to three presynaptic neurons, A, B, and C. Let's first start by applying a stimulation only on one neuron, neuron A. So we apply the stimulation here. We notice on the graph that we obtain... Yes, an EPSP, not large enough to cause an action potential because it's not reaching the threshold, but it's an excitatory postsynaptic potential nonetheless. If we do the same thing on B, we also get something similar. An EPSP, still not reaching the threshold. What if we combine the efforts of A and B? Cooperative, just like my children, working together to get what they need. If we apply a simulation on A and B at the same time, we notice that this time, what happened? We obtained an EPSP, still not reaching the threshold, but this time it has a larger amplitude. What happened in this case is what? Is the summation of the EPSP caused by A and by B to obtain an EPSP of a larger amplitude. So here we have summation of afferent messages giving an EPSP of higher amplitude despite not giving an efferent message. 
Let's look at neuron C now. If you apply a simulation to neuron C, we notice, oh, there's something new here. We notice that in this case, the membrane potential is more negative. It's not closer to the threshold. It's further away from the threshold. So what do we call this wave? Precisely, it's an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. The synapse here between C and the postsynaptic cell is actually inhibitory. It's unlike the, others two, the other two synapses. So let's apply a simultaneous stimulation on both A and C together. A, remember, gives an EPSP. It has a, an excitatory synapse with the postsynaptic cell, whereas C induces a hypo, hyperpolarization or an IPSP. So let's stimulate them both together. Notice now we get still an IPSP. However, its amplitude is smaller than it was when we had C working alone. So the combination of both um, inputs resulted in a wave of smaller amplitude. This means that we have actual summation, an algebraic summation of the two values. E A, uh, again, remember, was giving an EPSP. Um, C was giving an IPSP, but reaching approximately minus 80. Now we still get an IPSP, but this time it's, it has a smaller amplitude. So this type of integration of afferent messages is called spatial summation. It doesn't have to do anything with outer space. It just means that we're getting input from different places. So the summary of the lesson at the end, these are the following ideas that you should know. First of all, the afferent messages are the messages that arrive to the nerve center. The efferent ones are the ones that are elaborated by the nerve center. And nervous integration, the main idea of the lesson, is a property of nerve centers by which they integrate, or a nerve center integrates or combines all the received afferent messages by spatial or temporal summation and then elaborates a suitable efferent message. So we have temporal summation, we have input several inputs from the same stimulus or the same um, synapse successively one after the other they are added to give a response or not in the postsynaptic cell we have spatial summation we have input from three different synapses in this example it can be more or less and then the postsynaptic cell responds accordingly and finally i would like to recommend an exercise from the official exams you can solve this session 2010 the first exercise exercise the first session, sorry, exercise four. Um, it has uh, very nice ideas relating directly to this lesson. And thank you very much. Subscribe, subscribe.